Hey guys, how's it going? Welcome back to the Super Flat series. I'm pretty excited about today's episode because I get to start a new project. But I am going to change up the pace slightly with these videos and how I get them out to you guys. Instead of starting and finishing an entire project in one video, it's going to be an ongoing series. And there's two reasons why I've done this. The first one being I want to upload more frequently for you guys. Instead of you having to wait kind of five, six months in between each episode. And the second reason is because I want to get as many as you guys involved in the project as well. And that would be quite difficult if I just did the entire project in one video. But that's enough about the channel. Let's move on to what's going to consume my life for the next couple of months probably. So for the past week or so, I've been extremely addicted to watching people play Tango Tech's Decked Out 2. If you're unaware of what that is, it's basically a dungeon crawling, loot hunting adventure map completely built in survival Minecraft. It's absolutely incredible. I highly recommend you go check it out. So I've decided I kind of want to build my own. It's going to be nowhere near as in-depth as Tango Tech. It's just because I don't have the redstone knowledge for that sort of stuff. But that being said, I still reckon I can make quite a fun, interesting game. I'm going to build it up in the sky just so I can uh, avoid all the slimes from spawning and also it gives me plenty of room under the map for all the redstone and things like that. And to give you an example on how big I'm aiming to make this game, each level is probably going to be roughly the same size of the zoo and I'm planning to have three levels in total. While I'm gathering some materials to get this project started, I'll show you a video of me naming all the animals from last episode. Thanks for all the comments and see if you can spot your name. Again, thank you to everyone who got involved in the comment section for that video. That was great fun. If you are interested in getting an animal named after you, there's still time. So head over to that video, pop a comment down below and yeah, I'll get that sorted. I'm going to stop building for a second. I just want to briefly explain to you how this dungeon crawling game is going to work. I've split it up into four simple steps. Step one is just to kind of loot around the whole map looking for coins and secret treasures. And then once you've got enough loot, you can trade that for a enchanted compass. And then follow the compass, that will lead you to your key eventually. And then once you've got your key, you just got to head to the exit. And depending on what level you're on, you've either gone to the next level or you complete the game. Like I mentioned earlier, it's going to be split up into three sections. Stage one is going to be set in a spooky dark forest with a graveyard, which I've just started over there. Stage two is in the kind of main haunted house building. It's got an upstairs and a downstairs. And the final stage is set in the basement of the house, which also breaks into an abandoned mineshaft. I'm going to crack on and get this build started. And while that's happening, let me hop into a creative world and show you how the enchanted compass works. So the idea is for the player to sneak around the map, dodging the enemies and finding the coins. Once they've got enough coins, they can buy one of these, which is an enchanted compass. And instead of the needle pointing north, it's actually going to point to a lodestone it's linked to. Once the player has passed the spot they're looking for, you'll see the needle swing back around. That shows the player that they're right on top of it. All they need to do is chuck the compass to the ground and up comes a key. It's actually a tripwire hook, but we won't talk about that. Let me show you how it works. It's very simple. Let me just grab the compass out of here. So this compass is linked to this lodestone. And directly above the lodestone is the minecart hopper that catches the compass, passes it down to the next hopper into the barrel that stores it. And as it does that, this little comparator here sends up a signal to the dropper and that sends the key up back to the player. I am fully aware that there's no filter on this though, so you can chuck any old junk in. So take this spruce plank for instance, throw that in and I'll still get a key. So there is going to be a little bit of honesty involved, but saying that it's only going to be people I trust and my friends that are actually going to be playing this. And also I'm going to have a free cam watching the player every run. So if I spot any cheating, I'll tell them to bugger off. And the last thing I want to mention about these compasses is there's going to be multiple locations for different keys on the same map. All that means is if the player wants to play multiple times, they shouldn't get the same key location over and over again. I'm hoping to have about nine locations per map, so yeah, should keep it nice and fresh.
As you can see behind me, I've been pretty busy for the last couple of hours. Oh, we're being watched. Anyway, uh, I've been slowly working my way through this uh, build. I haven't really been following a plan exactly. I've got a kind of a rough idea in my head of how I want it to look, but I've been kind of just going with the flow. And uh, I'm excited to show you the, uh, the foundations of the adventure game. So obviously once it's all up and running, this is going to be a little bit fancier of an entrance. But this is where the player will enter the map. I haven't done anything to the left so far, it's just all down the right hand side. You start in this kind of nice thick oak forest. You've got a path that heads down this way. Down by the river. And you go through this fancy little archway with a nice little water feature. And you see you've got another pathway to your left and that's going to follow the soul sand torches. But then if you carry on straight down here, then there's a slight change in scenery in this little kind of stony corner. The detailing at the minute is pretty much at the bare minimum. I just kind of want to get the kind of main framework done of the level and then we'll proper push through the details and that's what really makes the map feel real. Then if we make our way around here, we've got some water barrels tucked up in this corner. I've got a bit of a weird empty space here at the minute. I'm not too sure what will fit. So any suggestions, drop them down in the comments. And over on this item frame should be a bit of dry kelp. Do I have any on me? Uh, nope, unfortunately not. But dry kelp is going to be the main source of food for the player. I'm happy how it's looking at the minute. It's shaping up pretty well. So far, so good. Uh, but I'm not going to lie. These concrete walls and concrete ceiling is taking forever. That's where most of my time's going at the minute. So I might have to just finish the shell of the room and then I can fully concentrate on the features. So apart from sneaking around, trying to stay alive, finding a key and getting out in one piece, there's also a scoring system involved. And that's just basically the total number of points you get depending on how valuable the loot that you found is. So let me show you a couple of examples of the hidden loot chests. There's one tucked just behind this wall here. There's also one in the corner with the water barrels. And I'm probably not going to show all the secrets on every map on this series, just because uh, I kind of want to keep it a secret if there's any people watching that are actually going to play the map. Can you see any secrets here? Nothing in them. Have you spotted it yet? It's here in the corner. Uh, I've actually got a, uh, a nice little room down here. So some of you guys might be thinking, what is there to stop a player from entering the map, learning all the loot spots, and then just getting an epic max score run and just not being able to be beaten? So there's a, a couple of little rules that can stop that from happening. The first one is each player has a limited amount of lives. I haven't worked out how many lives yet, but uh, we'll work that out through player testing and things like that. And the second one is the longer you stay in the dungeon, the more kind of exposed you'll be to the harder mobs. So when you first enter, you'll probably notice there's going to be some zombies and ravagers. But as time progresses in the dungeon, you're going to more likely bump into kind of witches, skeletons, and maybe even some vexes. Before I wrap up today's episode, I just want to talk to you about the scoring and looting system. I feel like the quicker I get you guys on board with all the ideas and game mechanics that I'm thinking of, the more interested and invested you'll be in this project like me because I'm super excited to get this going. So you already know the main quest of the game which is to collect the iron coins and once you've got enough of those you get to trade for an enchanted compass which will lead you to your lodestone and your key location. While you're on your scavenger hunt for your key, it's always good to keep an eye out for some extra loot and treasure to maximise your points in the dungeon. Uh, all these points are currently subject to change, but we've got pieces of gold, which is worth one. And they're going to be in chests that are kind of fairly easy to find. And then we've got emeralds, which are worth a little bit more than the pieces of gold. And these are going to be in chests which are going to be in slightly harder spots to find, but still not too difficult. And then diamonds. Diamonds are going to be uh, in the chest, which you probably aren't obvious to begin with. A little bit of thinking, like behind here. Oh, we've got a little visitor. And diamond in here. Then we move on to the rare treasures. There's only going to be two of these on every map, so they are going to be quite rare and in very difficult spots. Points are still subject to change, but these are going to be kind of behind either hidden doors, uh, multiple levers, or even a little parkour. Do you reckon I can do it? Let's give it a go. Yep, yeah, 
one more, the easy jump, and there we go. And for your troubles, you'll find a rare treasure and maybe an iron coin just to help you on your key quest. Last but certainly not least is the ultra rare loot piece. There's only going to be one of these on the entire map and it's going to be worth some big points. The only difference is once a player finds one of these, if they do any more runs after, uh, this will actually not be on the map, so it's a one-time use. You've also got to bear in mind I'm building this in a survival Minecraft world as well, so it might not be a never start depending on how many I can get my hands on before the game starts. So that's where I'm at with the scoring and looting systems. If you have any suggestions or ideas and you want to get involved with this project, I've actually made a Discord channel all based around this game. I'll leave a link in the description below this video. So if you want to come have a chat, get involved, follow the link below. And we're discussing everything from gameplay to scoring mechanics to redstone machinery, everything like that. The last things I want to discuss about are power ups and food. So this is just an idea I'm toying with at the minute and it uses the ender chest mechanics pretty well. So before the player enters the dungeon, they'll have a choice to pick one power up. These are just examples. So maybe a swiftness potion, maybe some golden carrots or a slowness potion for some mobs they can throw at. And before they go in, they'll pick one, pop it into the ender chest. And if they're lucky enough to find an ender chest while on the map, they get to use their power up. Same with the treasures and loot. I kind of want the ender chest position to be kind of random. So it's not just always in the same spot so the player can just instantly run to the ender chest and have a power up from the get go. So I want food, hunger and health to be a big factor in the game as well. I want you to strategize when and if you're going to eat. And I don't want to give them really overpowering food as well. So I've just put a couple of examples here, dry kelp and glow berries for now. But if you've got any other suggestions, remember to head over to the Discord and join in with the discussions. So uh, I've got a feeling I've waffled on for way too long there. So I'm just going to end the episode here. Much appreciated. Thanks for watching. And until next time, see you later, guys. Bye.